make rights, uh, such as the ones that are enumerated in Article 55, 25, which I'll quote, uh, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Uh, these provisions have been reaffirmed in the enabling conventions of the General Assembly, which are intended to implement the stated rights, and also in uh, international agreements on the right of development, uh, usually in virtually the same words. Well, it seems reasonably clear that this formulation of universal human rights uh, rejects the impeccable logic of the chief economist of the World Bank, uh, if not as insane, at least as profoundly immoral which was, in fact, the virtually universal judgment, at least insofar as it was publicly expressed. People thought, I don't know. Uh, here, uh, the word virtually uh, must not be overlooked. It was a virtually universal judgment. Uh, as is well known, uh, many nations are condemned as what are called relativists, uh, who interpret the Universal Declaration selectively and reject components that they don't like. Now, there's been a great deal of indignant uh, rhetoric about uh, what are called Asian relativists, or of course the unspeakable communists who descend to this degraded practice. Uh, for some reason less noticed is uh, that the leader of the relativist camp uh, happens to be the leader of the self-designated enlightened states, uh, the world's most powerful state. Uh, we see examples of this uh, almost daily, although C is perhaps the wrong word because we see them but uh, manage not to notice them. So to illustrate, let's just go back two weeks ago to March 1st. Uh, on March 1st, there were lead stories in the press on the release of the State Department's annual report on human rights around the world. The spokesperson at the news conference unveiling the report was Paula Dobriansky, who's the un Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs. And she emphasized, I'm quoting her, that promoting human rights is not just an element of our foreign policy, it is the bedrock of our policy and our foremost concern. That's as much as it was reported, but there's a little more to the story as often the case. Uh, Dobriansky was uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Human Affairs in the Reagan and Bush number one administrations. And in that capacity, she sought to dispel a certain, uh, what she called certain myths about human rights. The most salient uh, is the myth that so-called economic and social rights constitute human rights. And she denounced the efforts to obfuscate human rights discourse by introducing these spurious rights, which are entrenched in the Universal Declaration, which in turn was formulated at US initiative, but is explicitly rejected by the US government. Uh, let me stress US government. Uh, the population has sharply different opinions and attitudes, as we would expect when we look at universals of human rights and moral universals generally. And again, there's a very clear current illustration is being reported. Uh, part of it was the federal budget was announced a couple of weeks ago, next year's federal budget, and along with it, uh, there was released something that wasn't reported, namely a study of public reactions uh, to the budget by the world's most prestigious institution uh, for the study of public opinion, uh, the uh, program on policy attitudes at the University of Maryland. Uh, the public turns out, calls for drastic cuts in military spending, sharply increased social spending for education, medical research, job training, conservation and renewable energy, increased spending for the United Nations and economic and humanitarian aid, and reversal of Bush's tax cuts for the wealthy. Uh, government policy is dramatically the opposite in every respect, and there's very little discussion about that within the political system or the intellectual culture, the media, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern these days, international concern, uh, 
here too, um, about uh, the consequences of what are called the twin deficits that are expanding, the uh, trade and budget deficits. Uh, closely related to them is a third deficit, uh, the growing democratic deficit. It's the term we use for others who have formal democratic institutions, but they don't function. Uh, and that's very little discussed because the democratic deficit is very much welcomed by wealth and power, which have every reason to want the public uh, removed from policy choices and implementation, uh, which should be a matter of considerable concern, quite apart from its relation to universal human rights. Well, in extenuation of Dobriansky, I should say that it's unfair to focus on her because her position is standard. Uh, UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick uh, described the socioeconomic provisions of the Universal Declaration as a letter to Santa Claus. Neither nature, experience, nor probability informs these lists of entitlements, that's in quote, uh, scare quotes, entitlements which are subject to uh, no constraints except those of the mind and appetite of their authors. And the same view was expressed in 1990 by the U.S. representative to the U.N. Commission on Human Rights, uh, Ambassador Morris Abram. Uh, he was explaining Washington's unilateral veto of the U.N. Resolution on the Right of Development, which uh, virtually repeated the socioeconomic provisions of the Universal Declaration. But these are not rights, Abram informed the Commission. They yield conclusions that seem preposterous. They are little more than an empty vessel into which vague hopes and inchoate expectations can be poured. And they're even a dangerous incitement. The fundamental error of the alleged right to development is that it presupposes Article 25 of the Universal Declaration and assumes that it actually means what it says and is not a mere letter to Santa Claus, and that's preposterous, clearly. Uh, so it would uh, seem to follow, then, that we should affirm the impeccable logic of the Summers memo on pollution, uh, though no one says so in public, uh, perhaps because they would be regarded as insane. Well, this teaches us something about several topics. Uh, one of them is about universal moral judgment, uh, and the other is about the moral and intellectual culture in which we live, which forcefully rejects uh, universal moral judgments. Uh, there are innumerable other cases. Uh, I presume you noticed a couple of days ago uh, at the uh, appointment of John Bolton as ambassador to the UN that Condoleezza Rice uh, praised Jean Kirkpatrick as a model uh, for what an ambassador should be. Uh, reiterating what I just said implicitly. Uh, Bolton himself has been clear and forthright in expressing his attitudes toward the UN. Uh, he said, there is no uni United Nations. When the United States leads, the United Nations will follow. When it suits our interests to do so, we will do so. When it does not suit our interests, we will not do so. Uh, that position happens to be Maybe a little bit extreme, but it's r right about at the main bipartisan and uh, educated consensus. Uh, but it happens to be opposed by an overwhelming majority of the public. Uh, in fact, public support for the UN is so strong that a majority of the public even think that the US should give up the Security Council veto and accept majority decisions, uh, which is an unspeakable notion in the intellectual culture. Uh, and the numbers are kind of interesting in all these cases because the people who express these views have never heard them. Uh, each one must think, I'm crazy, but that's what I think. If they were ever discussed, uh, there'd be a, uh, you can guess that the numbers, which are high, would be even higher. Uh, but again, the democratic deficit prevails, so we don't have to worry about uh, universal moral uh, judgments. Uh, the principle of universality uh, arises in other important connections, too. Uh, one instructive example has occupied the world court for several years. Uh, after the 1999 NATO bombing of Serbia, a group of international lawyers presented uh, the International Tribunal on Yugoslavia with charges against NATO. Uh, they were relying on documentation which was 
produced by the major human rights organizations and, in fact, admissions by the NATO command. The uh, prosecutors refused to consider the matter in violation of tribunal rules, uh, simply stating that they relied on NATO's good faith. They undoubtedly knew what would happen to them if they didn't. Uh, Yugoslavia, however, uh, proceeded. It took the matter to the World Court, uh, and uh, the U.S. alone uh, withdrew from the proceedings at the World Court. The reason was that Yugoslavia had invoked the Genocide Convention, which the U.S. had, in fact, signed after 40 years, but with a reservation that it does not apply to the United States, which therefore retains the unilateral right to carry out genocide. And the court correctly agreed with the U.S. argument, and the U.S. was excused alone. Uh, that's uh, happened before, uh, also in ways that are highly relevant 